Okay, so let's derive S parameters and, and try to learn something about them along the way. In the S parameter scheme, we describe the two port in terms of what happens when we launch electromagnetic waves towards the ports. Now this requires a little bit of explaining. The figure shown here is a two port device in which the two ports are accessed using transmission lines. And these transmission lines have a characteristic impedance uh, which will get, give the variable Z0 or Z0. We'll assume that Z0 is real valued uh, as, since this will be the case for any practical transmission line that we might encounter. In fact, we'll typically assume uh, that Z0 is 50 ohms since this is a nearly ubiquitous choice in modern radio engineering. However, I should be clear that formally there is no specific requirement for the transmission lines to have a real valued uh, uh, characteristic impedance. And there's certainly no requirement for Z0 to have a specific value. Now I'm going to assume that you recall from a previous course in electromagnetics that the voltages along a transmission line are all related and can be interpreted as a superposition of electromagnetic waves which propagate in one or both directions along a transmission line. In particular, we could somehow cause a wave to travel from left to right towards port 1. And let's call that voltage, uh, we'll give it the name V super I sub 1 as a function of D, where D indicates the distance along the transmission line measured uh, from the uh, port to which it's connected. Unless the input impedance looking into port 1 is exactly Z0, we also expect to see a leftward traveling or reflected wave, as shown here. Let's call this voltage uh, reflected wave uh, V super O, O for output, sub 1, 1 for port 1, as a function of D. Now the total voltage as a function of D along the transmission line is given by the sum of these two things as I've indicated here. We need to do the same thing for current and this is pretty straightforward because we already know the voltages and we know how voltages currents are related to voltages on a transmission line. The current associated with the inbound voltage wave is just V super I sub 1 divided by the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and the current associated with the outbound voltage is minus V super O sub 1 divided by the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Now, mind carefully this minus sign. If you're not sure where that comes from, you should review your old notes on transmission lines where you will certainly have addressed this. The total current, I sub 1, it's just the sum of the two of the inbound and the outbound currents, and I've just written that out as an equation here. Now I'd like to take these equations for total voltage and total current, shown at the top here, and arrange, rearrange them a bit to get expressions for the inbound and outbound voltage waves, V super I sub 1, V super O sub 1, in terms of these total voltages and currents. And these are the resulting expressions. I'm just going to show you these expressions and I'll skip the details. But I assure you that this is a pretty straightforward step involving only simple algebra and I encourage you to confirm this on your own. Now I want to do just uh, two more simple things. Uh, first, I'll divide each side of each equation by the square root of Z0. That's what I'm doing in these equations. And then I'm going to evaluate both these equations for D equals zero. That means directly at the input or output ports, uh, well, excuse me, directly at the input port. And I'll call the resulting quantities A sub 1 and B sub 1. So what are A sub 1 and B sub 1? Well, frankly, they have no physical interpretation, and they're defined really just for our convenience. However, it's worth noting that A sub 1 and B sub 1 are associated with the inbound and outbound power waves, respectively, 
And then A sub 1 and B sub 1 both have units of uh, uh, square root of power. In other words, voltage over the square root of impedance or the square root of power. For this reason, A1 and B1 are sometimes referred to as power waves. Um, I personally feel this term is a little bit confusing uh, because they're actually square root of power waves. And my suggestion is that if you find this a little bit um, uh, confusing as well, just think of A1 and B1 as being voltage waves for a specified impedance. And then it's, it's a little bit more clear. Now that's all for port 1. For port 2 we can repeat exactly the same process and really the process is essentially the same just uh, really what happens is the subscripts change. So here's the, uh, the same math um, uh, just uh, for completeness but uh, the procedure is exactly the same. And then here is what we end up with for A2 and B2. Uh, very similar looking equations again with different subscripts. Okay, so now let's zoom out a bit and consider what we've got. We have the power waves A1 and B1 at port 1, and A2 and B2 at port 2. Each power wave is defined to be a linear combination of the total voltage and the total current at the associated port. We worked this out in the previous slides. Now think back to how we defined the Z, Y, and H parameters. In each of those schemes, everything hinges on the observation that the total voltage and the total current at each port, that is V1, V2, I1, I2, are all linearly related, can be described as linear combinations of each other. By linearly related, we mean that any one of these voltages or currents can be defined as this linear combination of the remaining voltages and currents. Since A1, V1, A2, and B2 are themselves linear combinations of these voltages and currents, then A1, B1, A2, and B2 must also be linearly related in the same kind of way. In other words, we know that there must be parameters, as I've described here, um, S11, S12, S21, S22, that relate the power waves to each other. So we call these parameters, S with the subscripts, uh, scattering parameters, or simply S parameters. The defining equations here, in the middle of the slide, can be interpreted as follows. Each outbound power wave, that is B1 or B2, can be described as uh, the combination of two inbound waves, that is A1 and A2, and the S parameters are simply the combining coefficients that we use to, to do that. At the bottom of this slide, I've included the matrix form of this same pair of equations, um, just written in, in the conventional matrix vector form. Uh, I've done this because you're likely to also see S parameters written this way, and in fact I will do this, uh, I'll show you an example of this later in the presentation. At this point, you uh, might fairly note that the preceding derivation of these non-physical power waves and their associated S parameters uh, seems a bit convoluted. Uh, you might wonder why Z, Y, or H parameters might not be a better way uh, to characterize two ports, even at radio frequencies. Well, there's two reasons for this, and uh, I'd like to just briefly show you uh, why. First, S parameters are relatively easy to measure because they are always the ratio of voltage waves. And this ratio of voltage waves is both physical and pretty easy to measure at RF. For example, you can see that from the equations that S21 is B2 over A1 when A2 is 0. Given the defining equations from the earlier slide, we immediately find, by substitution, that S21 then is the ratio of the outbound voltage wave from port 2 to the inbound voltage wave uh, at uh, port 1. And it turns out that this ratio is straightforward to measure at radio frequencies. Now, 
you might say, what do you mean by that? And uh, that's hopefully what you'll learn in your uh, lab component of this course. But if you're really interested in that, I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Just get with me separately. Contrast this, to really appreciate this, you want to contrast this to what it would take to do as a radio frequency measurement of the Z parameter Z21, for example. Since Z21 is the ratio of the voltage at port 2 to the current at port 1 when I2 is 0, um, well, what we're really saying here is that I2, that the second port is open circuited. That's what it means to have no current. It's open circuited. So there's two problems with this. First, it's tricky to measure the total voltage and the total current, that is uh, V and I, simultaneously at radio frequencies. That's the first problem. The second problem is the fact that we've open circuited uh, port 2. Uh, many RF devices behave differently and sometimes very badly when they're open circuited. In particular, the behavior of active devices such as transistors may be quite different when open circuited. The S parameter scheme avoids this problem by allowing us to measure and analyze devices at input and output impedances close to those at which the device is intended to operate. And that avoids the problem of the fact that the device can change its behavior when we measure it uh, using unusual or extreme impedances. The second reason why S parameters are popular is that they have useful physical interpretations which are not apparent in the other parameter schemes. For example, the Z parameter Z21 is just a coefficient. There's really not more, uh, not much more that you can say about it. However, we saw a few slides back that the S parameter S21 is the ratio of the outbound voltage wave from port 2 to the inbound voltage wave at port 1. This is a description of the forward voltage gain of the two port. However, since the transmission line on either side is defined to have the same characteristic impedance, that is Z0, the magnitude squared of this quantity is the forward power gain. And that's only true because the input and output impedances are equal. If the input and output impedances were not equal, then we would have a, a forward power gain in some sense, but it would be relative to other uh, impedances. This particular quantity is very convenient for RF work and you have to do a lot more work to get that kind of information from the Z, Y, or H parameters. So this is one reason why S parameters are, are pretty popular. The happy fact that S21 magnitude squared just happens to be the forward power gain of a two port is not a fluke. In fact, all the S parameters have useful interpretations. We'll go through these in a later lecture, but for now let's just consider one more, and that's S11. Reviewing the defining equations from a few slides back and applying what we already know, we see that S11 is B1 over A1 when A2 is 0, and that turns out to be the ratio of the outbound voltage at port 1 to the inbound voltage at port 1. And you know this already, this is the voltage reflection coefficient, uh, which is a, a useful and, and uh, uh, well-known, hopefully to you already, quantity. Uh, so we'll give this a special name. We'll call S11 uh, gamma sub 1. And what we mean by gamma sub 1 in this course is the voltage reflection coefficient looking into port 1 from a transmission line when port 2 is terminated into a transmission line and both transmission lines have uh, equal characteristic impedance equal to Z0, that is the reference impedance for which the S parameters are defined. So we should say a few more about this things about this uh, reference impedance. Let, let this be very clear. The values of the scattering parameters depend on the value chosen for the reference impedance Z0. That means that there is, in fact, not just one set 
of S parameters you can define for a two port, but there are an infinite number of S parameter values that you can define for a two port uh, because there's an infinite number of reference impedances that you can imagine using. Uh, said another way, uh, when you specify S parameters, you should also be clear about what reference impedance that those S parameters are defined for. Now, it's not quite as bad as that I may have just uh, implied. Usually this value is either stated or it's assumed to be 50 ohms. However, you have to be careful. Other common reference impedances include 75 ohms and 300 ohms, and, and these show up from time to time, along with other values. And in fact, there's uh, an application for reference impedances which are complex. That's pretty rare, but uh, it's useful in some applications. From this point forward, uh, the way we'll manage this is you can assume that the reference impedance is 50 ohms unless it's explicitly stated otherwise. So just be careful to check.